Can everyone hear me? Or have I just turned my mic off? OK, good. Right, sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble with uh, Teams today. Uh, yeah, welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, this is uh, a bit of a learning experience for me as well, because um, as Shelley has said, she's no expert, but to be honest, BNG is so new, there aren't really any experts yet, and we're making, <laughs> we're learning about BNG as it goes, because I'll, I'll explain in a minute, but it's not, it's a significant thing, but it hasn't had a period of piloting or bedding in before it's been launched. It's been left to local planning authorities, essentially, to to make it work, and it's, um, you know, that's, that's a good challenge, and local planning authorities and planners are good at this sort of thing, taking up uh, challenges and, and making things work. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm I'm hoping to learn as well because each time I try and explain BNG, I sort of learn a little bit more about it. So yeah, this is going to be good for me as well. Um, yeah, it is very new. I must admit that my session is more focused on uh, the decision making, planning application side of things. So uh, what we might do towards the end when we've got questions, or if you've got questions as we go, we could have some local plan focused questions um because uh, as luck would have it i had a couple of years experience in delivering or delivering planning advisory services support on local plans and shelley's a local plan planner so hopefully we can we can cover that so yeah um the focus is on planning though in general and you can't avoid the ecological uh, input to uh, biodiversity net gain um but I'm not a col uh, an ecologist, uh, so I'm not going to be able to give you any expertise on different habitats and how they interact and things like that. But I will be able to help you with the planning uh, side of things. Uh, it's a wide and varied uh, topic, so I've tried to structure this presentation and this session in a way that I think makes sense. But you know, you can you can tell me at the end if there are some big gaps in it, and that will probably come out in the questioning. Um, so. Uh, I don't know, Shelley, do we normally do questions as we go or questions at the end, or should we just see how it goes? Uh, we tended to do questions at the end, but um, I'm I'm happy to do it in yeah. whichever way you would like. Yeah. If if something really does need uh, you know, you you know, just put your hand up and we'll we'll cover it. So I'm gonna share my screen. And put it on presentation mode. Okay. Can you all see a presentation? Yep. Good. Okay. Right. Uh, so, biodiversity net gain. This is what we're going to cover. Um, yeah, we'd go through the key players. What are the key organisations? Um, there are many, many organisations, but there are some key ones that we need to be aware of. Um, we're going to go through some BNG. Basics. I'm going to go through the decision making process. Uh, not every application um, has BNG applied to it, so I'll go through some of the exemptions. There's a thing called a biodiversity net gain hierarchy, which is essentially the different uh, ways that you can mitigate or um, improve habitats. Uh, there's a hierarchy of the ways you can do it, and I'll explain that in the decision making process. Um, Biodiversity net gain can be achieved on site, so on the site of the planning application itself, or you can organise to have biodiversity net gain compensated for off site. And I'll go uh, through some of the options for that. There are some trading rules, so they're essentially around uh, what habitats can or can't replace existing habitats. Uh, and then I'll try and touch on the metric and then I'll just touch on some key challenges that local planning authorities are facing at the moment. So let's go. OK, so the key players. So the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, that's DEFRA. Uh, they set national policy and regulation for uh, environmental protection. So they are uh, the key government department behind the initiative of biodiversity net gain. Natural England uh, are, a, a, I guess, an agency that are linked very closely to, to DEFRA, and they have the sort of oversight for the implementation of DEFRA's national policy, so the, the nuts and bolts and how it works on the ground. We had the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, which when some of you joined might have been the Department for Leveling Up Homes and Communities, but that's now changed to MHCLG with the Labour, new Labour government. 
Uh, so they are in charge of national planning policy and they set out the sort of parameters for local planning authorities. So that they're the sort of three uh, key organisations apart from, of course, local planning authorities themselves. This won't happen without uh, uh, our input. So local planning authorities, obvious decided planning applications, setting policy and uh, being party to legal agreements to secure biodiversity net gain on development sites. A uh, couple of resources. Once again, you know, there are many, many uh, organisations, many, many resources out there. But if you're going to start anywhere, the .gov.uk biodiversity collection uh, is a really good place to start. It, it's in one place. It's got all of the government's um, guidance on biodiversity net gain. So it's really useful. And I would say this wouldn't I, but the PADS website is a good resource and our base camp network. So when you get this presentation, there are links there for you to access the websites and on the Basecamp network link there's a form you can fill out to join the network should you so desire or if I haven't put you off by the end of uh, this presentation. So just generally so the whole point of uh, biodiversity again is to improve habitats uh, and improve them through the planning system. So BNG was introduced by the Environment Act which essentially had uh, an annex to it that made updates to the Town and Country Planning Act to affect uh, um, to affect local development applications and how they uh, uh, how they uh, deliver biodiversity net gain. So it's it's a framework essentially for thinking about how um, you can reduce the amount of habitats that are lost um, to development because there's always an element of habitat being lost once a development site is. Uh, begin essentially begins building on you know the, the trees and bushes and grasslands are cleared and uh, the whole point of, of biodiversity net gain is that that um, that loss as a result of development is replaced and then improved by 10 percent and I'll go into this in a moment but there, there's a national condition that sort of applies by law that says you will improve your uh, development site by 10 percent in biodiversity terms um, it's, a, it's like a, a, a national condition for a planning application. Um, this is a new skill set in many ways for for, for planners, and I'll, I'll go through why uh, in a moment. It's essentially around the process of decision making where normally before we make a decision in planning, we like to have everything in front of us, all of the information and know exactly what the uh, developer is going to do to deliver what they say they're going to do. With biodiversity net gain, it's not always um, possible um, at the early stage to know exactly how you're going to um, deliver biodiversity net gain. Um, and the way the process is set up, the developers don't necessarily have to tell us everything about how they're going to deliver biodiversity net gain before we actually make the decision. So when we make the decision on applications where biodiversity net gain applies, we need to, in the, the decision making process, got to a stage where we're confident that the developer is going to be able to deliver the biodiversity net gain. And they then, um, once they've got the decision, they will um, uh, provide what's called a biodiversity game plan. And I'll go into that uh, on the next slide in a bit more detail. Uh, yeah, and existing policy and protections for the environment, they all stay in place. Biodiversity net gain does not replace those. Um, biodiversity net gain is a, is a separate as well as uh, existing policy and, prote and protections. It's really important as well, the, the two points in uh, italics there, um, you know, this is, you know, we're seeing as world leaders, the English planning system is seen as a world leader in this. Um, uh, it, it's it's a fairly unique scheme, the way that development is is being um, asked to deliver uh, biodiversity gains. So, you know, it's it's tough at the moment because it's quite new and we're all finding out how it exactly works. But, you know, we're part of something that's really groundbreaking. And, you know, the, the eyes, uh, it's not, not too far a stretch to say the eyes of the world are looking uh, at the English planning system for how well uh, this works. So I think it's quite an exciting thing to be involved in. So uh, timing. So when did biodiversity in again go live? Well, it's been phased in. Um, the initial phasing came in for uh, major developments, uh, ap major applications. So that's large um, housing developments, large um, commercial developments. Um, that, that happened after the 12th of February 2024. And then small sites, smaller developments, 
um, uh, after April the 2nd, 2024. And there are some things called nationally strategic infrastructure projects. So they are sort of big wind turbine schemes, offshore energy, um, big national uh, infrastructure projects known as NSIPs. Uh, they will be coming in for biodiversity net gain in November 2025. And just a couple of points, um, the regulations for BNG were finalised, uh, I think in November last year. So if you think about the time span between November and the 12th of February for planning as a sector to get geared up for this, it's not a lot a lot of time for something so uh, widespread uh, and important. And um, yeah, so you've got major applications and small site applications and there are certain exemptions, so certain types of development and applications that it doesn't apply to, and I'll cover those in a moment. So the decision-making process. So um, for those of you not familiar with the development management side of things, when an application comes in, it goes through a process, sort of three main parts to it. You have validation. So is all of the information there? Is there an application? Has it been properly uh, filled out? All the information I would expect to see as a planner and any additional information and reports that you'd expect to see for the particular type of development. You then have the consideration of the information and you'd probably in, in there you might consult, uh, consult local communities and other stakeholders and then you make the decision. Uh, and on the screen here we've got something called post decision and that's quite important for biodiversity net gain and I'll explain that in a, in a, in a moment. So a validation you would expect to see the planning application all the details of the application and a baseline assessment made through a spreadsheet called a metric that's available from Natural England. Um, so there's a baseline assessment and that's an assessment of the biodiversity value of the site at, at before any development has happened. Um, not much else is required by regulation. So um, what m lots of councils and local planning authorities are doing is, is asking the developer, look, we know you don't you might not know exactly how you're going to uh, mitigate against biodiversity or mitigate for biodiversity net gain. Um, but, you know, you must have some idea of, of what you're going to be delivering, how you're going to carry it out. And most good um, developers and agents will have some idea and be able to share some of that information. So they might be able to say, we don't know exactly yet, but we think we're going to be able to um, meet most of the biodiversity net gain requirement within the, the development site itself or they might say most of it will be on the site itself but we think we we might have to buy uh, or arrange for some uh, off-site biodiversity gain to uh, to make the complete requirement. So for uh, significant gains and I'll explain what significant gains are in a moment but for 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 significant and large um, uh, uh, biodiversity net gain um, the, the local planning authority needs to secure that uplift um, in value of biodiversity for, for 30 years. And that's done through a legal agreement, a uh, condition and or a, con or a conservation covenant. I'll explain all of those in a moment, but essentially you need a legal agreement to secure some for 30 years. And a, and a legal agreement of that length of time uh, is quite new for local planning authorities in development management terms. So that's another um, new thing for, for planners that we're all getting used to. And then um, I mentioned earlier, didn't I, a, uh, a national condition. Uh, now, when when a planning application is uh, decided, some often conditions apply to the the the, the approval of the, of the the development to say um, we're approving this plan as long as X, Y and Z happens and here's the condition that we'd like to see put in place. With with um, biodiversity net gain there's a national automatic condition that you will make the 10% uh, improvement and that that will be delivered through what's called a gain plan. So the developer once they've got the permission will create a biodiversity game plan that will have all the details of how they're going to meet the 10%. That game plan is then approved before development can start. So you might not have all of that information before the decision's made, but you will have all of that information and the developer has to convince you of, of, that they're going to deliver it um, by producing a biodiversity game plan that you need to sign off or we need to sign off as planners. So unless we sign that off, development can't, can't start. So there's a little bit of a, a safety net. So, yeah, there's a bit of a change in how we normally make decisions. So going back to that validation, say the, the applicant only has to provide information about the baseline condition of the site. So the baseline condition uh, is X, the impact of the development on that site is Y, and BNG 
needs to restore the condition of the site to at least that baseline condition plus 10 percent so you understand the baseline you understand the damage if you like that your your development's going to do you then replace that and then improve it by 10 percent and so as, as i said before full details of how it will how BNG will be achieved does not need to be provided until after that decision has been made. But as I said earlier, if you're working with good developers and um, throughout the process, good agents, you know, it's in their interest to keep the council, um, you know, ap ap appraised of how they're going to meet BNG because they can take advice from the council, take advice from the planners, take advice from the ecologists in the planning uh, team or uh, or from outside the planning team about their ideas, because some of their ideas for how they might deliver biodiversity gain, net gain might not ultimately, ultimately be workable. So the sooner they start to talk about that, uh, the better in the process. So the, the national condition. So on, a, on approval of the application, um, there's a general condition that applies uh, to each development and it will say something like, this is just an example, you know, the de development may not begin until a biodiversity game plan has been submitted to the uh, planning authority and that that plan has been approved. And the biodiversity game plan will include details of how uh, biodiversity net game will, will be uh, achieved and how it will be maintained uh, and, and progress monitored. So if you think some of um, you know significant biodiversity net gain has to be um, secured over 30 years, um, there has to be some monitoring uh, and progress tracked to make sure that the, the, the biodiversity gain is happening, is on target and is being regularly, regularly monitored. And uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 a plan that helps with that called a habitat management and monitoring plan. So that will form part of the biodiversity game plan. So these are all things that give us as planners confidence that, you know, there's an agreement in place, that there's a biodiversity game plan, and there's a management and monitoring plan that means that the game that the developers saying they'll deliver will happen. So securing the gain. So where the gain is significant, and when we say significant, um, it could be the quality of the habitat. So it's really high quality habitat that's being replaced. Um, you know, that, that's really important. We want to make sure that that is secured. Um, you know, it might be the, the sort of the nature of the game it might be a, a really large site um, that we really want to make sure that the volume of that sort of gain is is secured. And, you know, it might be a site of local strategic importance of somewhere, you know, historical. It might be, you know, uh, important for local communities. And, you know, it's really important that this site is as guaranteed as possible that that the gain is going to occur and that the that's that's that needs to be secured uh, for 30 years so a condition can be used to uh, secure the gain um and now this is where it gets confusing and this is where uh <laughs> yeah it starts to get a little bit tricky because i've already mentioned haven't i a a national condition that applies to every development that that has bng on it and that's a national condition that says that you'll up by 10 percent and you will produce a biodiversity game plan as proof that you're going to do it that will sign off but you can use a, a separate condition to secure the delivery of the habitat and go into the details of how that habitat is actually going to be secured so there's one that says we're going to do it and here's how we're going to do it and then a at a condition that can secure that 30 years. So the legal agreement, you know, that ensures that the site owner delivers the required biodiversity net gain and that there's monitoring in place for that 30 year period. And with monitoring, there are going to be costs involved and the legal agreement will normally uh, uh, set out um, how the costs and how those costs are going to be met. Conservation covenant is another form of legal agreement that can be used to secure biodiversity gain over 30 years. But I'm going to come to that later when I explain some of the different on and off site ways that gain can be secured. So a little bit on exemption. So um, essentially, it doesn't make sense for BNG to apply to absolutely everything because, you know, the planning system deals with a lot of small development where securing the gain won't be cost effective and securing the gain, uh, you know, it won't be that easy to actually ensure that the gain is going to actually survive uh, a period of time. So things like, um, you know, household garden, trying to secure biodiversity gain somewhere where uh, kids, etc., really kicking footballs about and dogs are going to be running about. There's there's no point in them um, trying to secure gain. So there are there are um, 
planning applications are always exempt. So there's a thing called permitted development in the planning system where certain types of development up to certain sizes and certain types are sort of deemed um, to be not approved, but they're, they're deemed to be allowed and they go through a much less rigorous planning application system um, or process. Householders and so householder applications. So any application uh, to, to deal with a, a dwelling where uh, you know a family essentially lives, I, I guess, is, is is a way of describing it. So things like extensions and garage conversions, things like that, they're not going to be caught by by diversity net gain. There's a type of development called a self build where a, a potential um, homeowner will work with a, a a developer and put a lot into the design of their own house. Um, and biodiversity gain sites themselves. So I'll explain some of that in a moment when I talk about Habitat Bank. So you can just have a, a site that is improved in biodiversity um, terms, and um, that could be used to offset biodiversity gain on other, other sites. So it doesn't make sense to for a site that's being improved to then be improved by a further 10%. So that's, that's, um, that's exempt. Um, there's qualified exemption, so um, not everything in the category is exempt, but it might be exempt by the size. So if it's below 25 square meters in terms of size of impact on habitat, it will be um, it will be exempt. If uh, basically a you know a concrete, a big concrete car park with no biodiversity habitat on it, that will be exempt. Uh, and temporary development. So if the development is only going to be in place for you know, less two years or less, um, there's no need to. Uh, comply with the biodiversity gain uh, regulations. Uh, and there's some there's some other uh, uh, exemptions around retrospective applications and, and, and types of appeals that are not part of the system at the moment, because in terms of writing the regulations at the time uh, that was available to write the regulations, they, they didn't quite, uh, the government weren't quite ready to, to include those types of uh, applications. But there, there are plans to, to introduce uh, more application types into the system at some point. So just a little asterisk on householders, you know, for most councils, householder applications are probably, you know, the most, uh, um, you know, the most large in number of types of applications that they get. So, you know, most applications you deal with, uh, you know, won't be subject to BNG. And, you know, the, the idea is that this is to try and, uh, you know, improve the environment. So it really makes sense that the biggest and most substantial applications um, are, are, have, the biodiversity net gain applied to them. Hierarchy. OK, so um, I've, I've mentioned on site, off site. Let me just explain that a little bit more. When once um, uh, it's decided that a case or an application uh, qualifies to, to meet the, the biodiversity net gain requirements, there's a hierarchy that the developer needs to follow. So ideally, um, Biodiversity gains are require are are met on the actual development site itself. So it stays local. It stays on the site. It's within the control of the developer or the site owner, and it's just um, you know much less risky. And um, and it's always good if biodiversity can stay as close to the habitat where it's been being replaced, if you like. So as close to the development site itself. Uh, there's so if if. Uh, all of that biodiversity gain can't be met on the site itself, then uh, the developer uh, can try and meet that gain off site as well. So that might be uh, a site that's within the developer's control. That's maybe next. It might it might be next to the uh, main development site itself, or it might be a site that's um, in a, in a totally another part of the country that has been. Um, improved and put into a habitat bank which i'll explain in a moment and the developer can essentially buy units biodiversity units to add to top up what they can't deliver on site so you can have a mixture of on site and off site and then if um if if either on site and off site uh, as a combination the biodiversity gain can't be met there is this sort of backstop or sort of um insurance if you like where there is a national credit scheme run by the government. So essentially, um, this is uh, basically putting us in the position where a developer shouldn't be in a position where they can't meet the biodiversity gain 
um, there will always be uh, a means of doing it. And the National Credit Scheme is that sort of backstop. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain a bit more about it in a moment. But it it's not in the developer's interest to go straight to that national credit scheme because the national credits are set up as being uh, more expensive, a lot more expensive than any of the others. And during the process to make the decision, the, the council wants to have satisfied itself that the developer has gone through that hierarchy and made sure that they've got all of all of the um, gain that they can on site and then where they can't, that the offsite is next. So going straight to offsite or straight to national credits uh, is not a thing you can do without having good evidence that you've exhausted um, the the availability to to meet the gain on site. So we're just going to go through a little bit more about those different on and off site um, situations. So yeah, on site biodiversity gain is achieved within the red line boundary of the development site. So I don't know if you've seen planning applications though you may be working in development management with the same planning applications with a red line around the site so the site that's affected by the development and on site is where the biodiversity gain is going to be de delivered in some way on that site so if you know trees are removed or lawns are taken up or grassland is is taken out within that red line then that on site biodiversity gain is where it's replaced and enhanced on the site um, Off-site uh, is where BNG is achieved on a, a site. It could be a site owned by the developer, but outside of that red line boundary. Um, but it could still be within the overall site. And sometimes that's known as blue line boundary. And we sometimes call that a linked site. So the landowner may be developing on this part of the site, but own some land close by that they're going to enhance and use the, the biodiversity units that that enhancement makes to offset some of the biodiversity gain required uh, on the development itself. The second kind of offsite um, that can be uh, 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 used to, to, to deliver biodiversity net gain is achieved on a site not linked to the development itself and is registered as a habitat bank. So as I say, it could be anywhere in the country where someone has um, some land that they've enhanced by 10% at least, and they then, um, that enhancement turns into biodiversity units can, that can then be uh, bought and sold uh, on the markets. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so to once those units are created by enhancing the land value, uh, those sites can be registered on um, a biodiversity register that's run by National England on behalf of uh, the government so that those units can then be bought and sold so a developer could meet 50 percent of the biodiversity requirement on the site can't get any more on the site need to buy some units off site and they go to um, a biodiversity uh, a habitat bank to buy those units so the habitat bank that's the market for biodiversity units off site so national credits a little bit of repetition here, um, but yeah, national credits set up by government essentially as a backstop. They're they're a, was they're the last resort because we want we want you, um, biodiversity to to uh, appear uh, to occur uh, on site and as near to the development as as possible, so that the where nature is disturbed or or uh, destroyed that it's replaced and improved as near to the where it's been removed as possible. And that's really important because if you're taking out uh, habitat uh, in local areas, we want local areas and local communities to benefit from the uplift in value. And they're made necessarily expensive to try and, you know, even if it is a last resort, it's, uh, uh, it's an expensive option. So just a little bit about how, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about the legal agreements and, um, I mentioned something called uh, Section 106 thing on one of my slides. That is a typical legal agreement. It's 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 referring to Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act, uh, which uh, sets out how um, those that are um, developing sites and creating uh, development, um, how they can contribute to um, some of the harm that that development might be causing or um, contribute to um, making the delivery of that site more uh, more amenable or more achievable, if you like, in terms of, you know, big housing developments need schools and doctors, surgeries, 
Um, so section 106 agreements are to between the developer and the local council to make sure that things that enable and um, help development uh, are are paid for by the developer essentially. So that sort of legal agreement is now um, being used to secure biodiversity net gain. So for on-site gains, um, there'll be a section 106 agreement between the council uh, and the developer to say, we're going to uh, deliver this sort of uh, biodiversity gain. It's gonna be over uh, 30 years and it will be monitored uh, by the terms of this legal agreement. Similar for um, the offsite gains, they need to be registered for part of a legal agreement, and you can't um, you can't buy or sell offsite biodiversity units unless they are registered with the Natural England Habitat Bank, and you need a Section 106 agreement legal agreement to be able to register them. So moving on to the Habitat Habitat Bank uh, offsite gains, once again, need a legal agreement or what's known as a con conservation covenant. And the reason um, I've mentioned a conservation covenant here, let me just try and make sure I'm going to explain this properly. Um, I'm just looking at my future slide. OK, a conservation covenant um, needs to be drawn up if a council itself, a local planning authority, is going to enter its own land into a habitat bank. And the reason a conservation covenant is required and not a legal agreement is because in most instances uh, uh, a council can't enter into a legal a section 106 agreement uh, with itself so they need to enter into what's known as a conservation covenant to be able to do that the council has to register itself as a separate process and i'm going to touch on this later i remember now uh, to become what's known as a responsible body once they are a responsible body they can then enter into a conservation covenant with themselves essentially to add their land into a habitat bank and i'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment about why councils might want to do that and then the uh the development national credits um they're run by the government um there might be a biodiversity statement involved, involved there and a game plan but essentially um it's an agree it's it, it's not an agreement between um local planning authorities it's a nationally run scheme so yes council's own, own land so it is a potential opportunity so as well as a developer wanting to um, get biodiversity gain on the site and buy off-site units on the market local planning authorities that own lots of land parks nature reserve they might want to include those that land on a habitat bank because they might want to um, uh, you use the, the income um, to support planning services or other services, but also use the income um, to enhance their own their own um, their own local environment. And as I say, the answer there is a conservation covenant. And to do this, the council has to register as a responsible body, and then it can enter into a conservation covenant so that it can register land with the habitat um, on the National England Habitat Register, so that it can the units can be bought and sold. So there are trading rules um, for biodiversity net gain, and that's essentially to ensure that you know there's there's never any net loss of biodiversity. So um, new habitats should ideally be replaced by habitats of the same type or those that offer greater ecological value. So um, you can't you know you can't remove a hedgerow and replace it with uh, with grasslands, you need to replace it with a hedgerow of a similar or or higher value biodiversity value. So you can't just replace uh, what you like um, with what you like. So just touching on the metric, so there's this metric that allows us to um, measure the baseline value of a site so that we can then understand how much gain we need to put in place to to deliver the, the full 10%. So um, there are two metrics. There is a full metric, the statutory metric that needs to be filled out by an ecologist uh, and completed by an ecologist. And that's going to be on large major sites and on complex um, where complex biodiversity habitats are are in place. Uh, and then there's the smaller sites metric, which can be used by and um, filled out by what's described as a competent 
people competent person that might be an ecologist but it might be a, a landowner that's got sufficient knowledge of their site and how the habitats work and how to uh, improve those habitats um, so that's a, a more sort of simplified version um, for use in more simple situations it's essentially the same metric just scaled down for use on smaller sites so the metric is a way to help manage workloads for ecologists because like um, many uh, areas of planning and you know you're playing your part by joining planning authorities by boosting our our resources um but there yeah you know, it's acknowledged that there are uh, aren't enough ecologists around at the moment to cope with uh, uh looking at every planning application so having a full metric for big large complex things and a smaller uh, less involved metric for smaller sites means that we don't have to ask ecologists to look at absolutely every application because that would just snarl up uh, the system. So there's two important elements. There's the data inputs to the metric and there are some rules that are inbuilt in the metric. So the rules that are built in are those trading rules that I mentioned earlier. So the metric, once when it's being filled out, it won't allow you to replace a hedge with a, a lawn. Uh, so that's a good uh, built built in uh, built in safeguard. It accounts for um, complexity of of uh, of of, a, of an environment of a habitat, uh, and it also helps encourage the developer to keep things local. So there are there are on that local basis there is what's called a spatial risk multiplier. So it multiplies things up by a factor as um, a biodiversity gains or units are moved further away from the site so if you're putting all of your biodiversity gain on site that multiplier won't apply but the further you move the habitat that you're going to replace away so by using off-site units it gets more expensive so it's all about trying to encourage biodiversity net gain to occur as close to the development where it's uh, where it's happening uh, yeah, so yeah, the risk multiplier, it recognises that, you know, habitats are difficult to create and enhance and they take time. Um, and there's a thing called the temporal risk, which, rec which recognises how long different habitats take uh, to make. So, you know, planting a tree to, you know, planting a young tree to replace uh, an established tree, you know, that that that's going to take um, at least 30 years, beyond 30 years. So, the um, calculator has something built into it that that will calculate up the units required to make sure that that habitat is properly uh, replaced over a period of time. And these, as I say, these are all inbuilt to the metric, um, and they they sort of force, if you like, to to well, incentivize people to to deliver their biodiversity gain as close to the development site as possible. Just got a little um, visual of what the 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 uh, metric looks like um, so it's just got various it's got quite a few ele uh, elements to it and each of these individual elements are filled out I say on a large site by an ecologist and it just sort of helps you understand um, the sort of prices that you might need to pay um, for for different types of uh, habitat mitigation so as you see it can be quite pricey um, in some instances so uh, Coming to the end really now, so the key challenges for local planning authorities are, as well as all the things I said about the, the, the process of, of um, making decisions on planning applications and the slight differences there to before BNG, um, that a lot of the exemptions are taking some time to bed in. So people making applications need to, aren't, need to fully understand whether their site is exempt. Um, and custom and self-building is a particular um, type of development where we're, we're seeing that there's lots of developments coming through claiming that they're self and custom build and we're trying to sort of make sure that they they are uh, and they're not just saying that to get away from the biodiversity net gain requirement and small sites um uh, there's a lot of applications coming in where you know people are take, just taking a judgment and not properly measuring things and saying well my, this is just a small small site it's de, de minimis it's claimed but then when you look at the drawings and look at the um the site itself is quite obvious that it's not it's not de minimis it's quite small but it's over that 25 meters threshold uh habitats are you know the trees are difficult so if you uh, i've learned this over the last few months but you know replacing a a tree with another tree is not um 
is not how biodiversity net gain works. So if you remove a tree, if you plant a new tree, um, the value of the tree you've replaced is measured by its canopy and its root structure. If you plant a new tree, there's no way it's going to be as uh, established root structure and canopy as the tree you've you've taken out. And a rough rule of thumb is if you take one tree out, you replace that by 10 new younger trees. And there's a cost to that. But I think there's also an incentive there for developers and um, architects to, to design design around existing trees uh, rather than rather than remove them, which I think is a, a better benefit for everyone. Uh, water courses are difficult. They have their own biodiversity uh, metric to be used on water courses. So that's another challenge for local planning authorities. Um, and gardens, yeah, as I said earlier, it's difficult to um, secure gains in gardens um, uh, because of you know it's difficult to 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 guarantee that they're going to be maintained. So certain certain habitats, you know, you can't secure them in in gardens. You have to secure them in in other ways. Um, uh, and habitat banks and uh, the offsite biodiversity unit market. Um, because local planning authorities are involved in um, issuing and negotiating these legal agreements, um, they're essentially in a position where they are um, having a say in who can enter that biodiversity net gain market um, because they're party to that Section 106 agreement. And there are going to be many applications to put sites into, um, into that market. And local planning authorities are going to have to decide whether you know the the whether they're working with good um good or bad uh uh organizations in terms of you know how many organizations to put in land in just to make a quick buck but how many are genuinely uh, um you know registering their land because for the good of the environment and to engage in that market properly it's a it's a a, a a requirement for local planning authorities that they're not used to being in that position of of be, of, of of regulating that market essentially so I think I'm going to stop talking there and I appreciate because I'm feeling as I'm delivering it that not everything I'm saying is 100% clear but thank you for bearing with me um I, I'll keep my screen up because you might want to go back to certain